Today's reading was written by the Reverend Tom Shade, a Unitarian Universalist minister, on August 14th of this summer, entitled, What Do We Do Now? He writes, We are far away from Ferguson, Missouri, and while I had a brief moment of temptation last night, I am not going to get in my car and go there to put my boots on the ground. You know all the adjectives, enraged, sickened, shocked, dismayed, saddened, etc. So what do we do now? I have to tell my UU ministerial colleagues that I do not particularly feel like going to the darkened UU church to sit in silence and stare thoughtfully at a burning candle. I do not feel like having a round-robin discussion, no crosstalk, please, of my feelings about this. I've been at those events. I've even presided over them. They seem like exercises in mass mood management carefully designed to prevent a loud and passionate political argument from breaking out to disturb the good order of the church. Let's keep things spiritual, which often means let's struggle to have benign thoughts about everybody at all times. So what do we do now? The police killing of Michael Brown and the police repression of the community that has demanded accountability should push people like us, who are more unfamiliar and misinformed about the conditions of life of African Americans than we think we are, into an extended campaign of learning, rethinking, and teaching. Learning, rethinking, and teaching are political acts of great significance and power. We should be talking to African American young men to learn firsthand what it is like. We should be learning about the patterns of housing segregation in our communities. Do you know your local police chief? How much firepower does your police force have? What political power does your police union have? We should be rethinking all of our big thoughts about the state of our political order. I am always amazed at the number of well-educated people who have quite radical analyses of particular issues, sophisticated anti-racist understanding or pacifist analyses of foreign policy, or penetrating thoughts on food and agriculture, and yet don't actually apply those to their political being. Overall, they are about as radical as John Stewart. I struggle with this myself. What does this situation actually mean? What will I have to rethink if I take it seriously? What would I have to rethink if I went from hashtag not all cops to hashtag yes all black men? And finally, we need to take this opportunity to teach, to challenge our friends, our neighbors, our families, all those who are more concerned about order than about justice. Learn, rethink, teach. The words of Reverend Tom Shade. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. That, of course, is the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution and all the laws that flow from it are part of a bargain that we as Americans have made. The bargain is simple, really. We promise to submit to the rule of law. We agree to abide by the laws passed by our lawmakers in exchange for the promise of an orderly society. A society of justice and tranquility, a society that promotes the general welfare and, as it says, secures the blessings of liberty. Why do we obey laws in the first place? Well, some of them we obey because they are morally right. But the vast majority of laws aren't so much about morality as they are about order. 
And so we promise to obey these laws in exchange for the promise that those in power make to keep our society running smoothly, to create opportunity for us to exercise our freedoms, the blessings of liberty, as it says, and to promote the well-being of all our citizens. It is a simple social contract. If we follow the rules, those who govern us will protect us, serve us, ensure equal treatment under the law, and work for our general welfare. The brutal slaying of Michael Brown in the streets of Ferguson, Missouri last month, and the police response to those who gathered in mourning and protest in the days following, showed us how terribly we as a nation have broken and continue to break our promise to African Americans and other people of color. That the moral fabric of this nation torn asunder by slavery has yet to be, to be mended. That the promise of peace, tranquility, opportunity, and equality are but mere empty words to a significant segment of our citizenry. Now it's true, we still don't know all the facts. But the facts we know are enough. Mike Brown was an African-American teenager. Mike Brown was unarmed. Mike Brown was shot six times by a white police officer. Michael Brown was left in the street for four hours, bleeding to death, as the local police tried to figure out how to handle this situation because they knew they had a situation on their hands. It's also a fact that the police in the town of Ferguson responded to the lawful gathering of protesters following Michael Brown's shooting with riot gear, military tactics and equipment, tear gas, and rubber bullets. Other facts that we know. 67% of the population in Ferguson, Missouri is black and 30% is white. Yet Ferguson's police force is 93% white and only 7% black. Another fact, black drivers in Ferguson are twice as likely to be stopped as white drivers. And 93% of all those arrested after a traffic stop in Ferguson, Missouri are black, 93%. Another fact, Ferguson's mayor and five of its six city councilors are white. Six of the seven local school board members are white. Another fact, in Ferguson, Missouri, only 12% of the population of Ferguson's eligible voters voted in the last election and fewer than 10% voted in the 2012 election. So those are the facts. And what the facts reveal is that in Ferguson, Missouri, as in much of our country, African Americans are underrepresented in the power structures that control their lives. What the facts reveal is that in Ferguson, Missouri, as in much of our country, people of color experience a pervasive sense of powerlessness. What the facts reveal in Ferguson, Missouri, as in much of our country, is that the scourge of racism, institutional, systemic racism, still survives in our country today and even thrives. Now you might say that the events in Ferguson were an isolated incident but the facts tell us otherwise. And I'm just going to throw a few more facts out at you today. Here's one. The median wealth of white families, the median wealth of white families in America is more than $113,000. While for black families, it's less than $6,000. $113,000, 6000 Another fact, nearly one-third more white Americans are homeowners than black Americans. In New York City, where people of color make up about half the population, 80% of the police stops are of blacks and Latinos. And listen to this, when whites are stopped, only 8% of them are frisked, while 85% of blacks and Latinos are. Nationally, African Americans make up about 13% of our population, but they comprise nearly 40% of the population in our prisons. So those are the cold hard facts. 
Writing shortly after the events in Ferguson last month, one African-American commentator put it this way, very simply, America is not for black people. America is not for black people. None of this comes as news to most of us, I don't think. As good, committed liberals, we understand about systems of oppression and injustice. We've read about the new Jim Crow and the prison industrial complex and the school-to-prison pipeline that treats young black men as chattel, as a commodity to feed the hungry maw of our private, our private for-profit prisons. We know that institutional racism wasn't eradicated by the civil rights laws of the 60s. We know that the Constitution's promises, that society's promises, are empty words to people of color in this country. And if we're courageous, if we're courageous, we even admit to our own white privilege and our own racism. Rachel Shadowan is a blogger. She describes herself as a lily white woman. She wrote in her recent blog, I'm a racist and so are you. The sooner we acknowledge this, the sooner we can begin to address the problem. She reminds us that, quote, racism isn't just conscious actions. It's judgments that happen so fast that we may not even be aware of them. Even people who are horrified by the idea of racism, she said, see through this lens, have this default programming. Even you, even me. Even you, and even me. It's hard to admit to being part of the problem when we so earnestly want to be a part of the solution. I experienced this internal tug of war last month, perhaps you did too, as I watched the protests in Ferguson and the police response, I experienced this overwhelming feeling of frustration and a powerful urge to do something. And at the same time, I was acutely aware of my white privilege. After all, I just spent an idyllic month in New England sitting by a lake eating fresh, locally grown food and reading books that I could download on my Kindle without worrying about the cost. I was lamenting the lack of moral leadership in our movement from the comfort of my safe little sanctuary in Swarthmore. My privilege, my white privilege, empowered my own sense of powerlessness. I wonder, has that happened to you? Following the events in Ferguson, I participated in an internet forum entitled Injustice in Our Justice System. It was presented by the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. During the course of this discussion, I learned a new term. I don't know if you've heard this before. The term is affluenza. Affluenza. Affluenza is an affliction that affects millions in our country. Its symptoms are apathy, lethargy, and myopia. Affluenza sufferers are self-centered and narcissistic. And affluenza is common among those who are financially secure, comfortable, and privileged. In fact, those with this disease are so privileged that they don't concern themselves with anybody else. They have theirs, so they're just fine. Thank you very much. Affluenza strikes when we're well off enough not to have to care. It can be easy to come down with a touch of the affluenza. Maybe it's not that we don't care, but it all feels so hopeless. It's too overwhelming. We are good people wishing things could be different than they are, but there's really nothing we can do to change our systems and structures of oppression. So we feel powerless and paralyzed. We wring our hands and shake our heads as we watch the news unfold, and then we go about our day doing the best we can for ourselves and our families. A touch of the affluenza. I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty sick and tired of feeling sick and tired, and feeling like I can't do anything that's important or meaningful or significant. We, and I am speaking to those of us who are white, those who are well-educated, those who are well-off. 
Those of us who are privileged enough not to have to worry if we'll get gunned down in the street by someone we thought was hired to serve and protect us, we can't afford the luxury of feeling powerlessness. Of feeling powerless. Because we are the ones with the power. The truth of the matter is that if I, if we, don't overcome our affluenza, if we don't start doing something, nothing is going to change. So, what is it that we can do? I asked myself this question last month, and so, for an answer, I turned to some people who were on the ground in Ferguson. We, in fact, had a relatively strong Unitarian Universalist presence in Ferguson, and I am privileged to know one of my colleagues, the Reverend Barbara Gaydon, who is the pastor of Elliott Chapel in another sub suburb of St. Louis. So I asked her, what can those of us who aren't there do? She told me the story of how she and some of the members of her church went down to the community center near the Canfield Apartments where Michael Brown lived and died. Residents of these apartments have been cooped up in their apartments because they couldn't get to work and they couldn't, and then all the schools were closed. They couldn't get to work because public transportation was shut down. The schools were closed. So Barbara and members of her congregation spent the day handing out energy bars, playing with children, watching kids on the playground, being with the people whose lives were affected most, listening to their stories. Barbara told me, everyone has a job in this, whether they are the sort of person who would walk into tear gas or rubber bullets or not. Wherever we are, racial profiling and injustice are causing great suffering. We all, she said, we all have something to do. And then I offer you this from another colleague in Ferguson, the Reverend Julie Tyler. Julie is a community minister in St. Louis and a, and a member of the UU Trauma Response Team. She actually braved the rubber bullets and the tear gas in Ferguson. Julie wrote this. For me, as someone who has only been living in the St. Louis area for two years, solidarity and accountability means showing up to everything that I hear about. Introducing myself as a UU minister and then keeping my mouth shut, keeping my mouth shut. I simply show up everywhere I am needed, show up, shut up, do what people ask of me, and show up again. Showing up and being of service is how relationships are built, she writes, how relationships are built and nurtured, particularly across lines of difference. And with relationships come mutual trust and the ability to take collective action to ensure that the seeds of healing, hope, and change don't die in fallow ground. That's what Julie Tyler tells us. And then you heard earlier Reverend Tom Shade, who said we need to learn to rethink, to teach. So what I take away from Barbara and from Julie and from Tom is a simple message. Show up, show up, shut up and listen, listen. Don't try to lead, listen, follow, build relationships, work side by side. While we can hold candlelight vigils and attend rallies and marches, what's most important, what's most meaningful in the long run, and this is the long run that we're talking about, is to build relationships with those who are not like us. To find ways to hear the stories and bear witness to the pain our society inflicts on people of color. You heard from Sandra this morning in the prisons what those people are going through, what they face, the challenges they have. And this doesn't happen, have to happen in faraway places like Ferguson. It can happen right here in our own communities. We here at UUCDC are blessed to have a relationship with two chapters of the local NAACP and one of our members is president of Chester Eastside, an organization working to help primarily children but children and families in Chester, one of our poorest communities.
So we have doors that are already open. All we have to do is walk through them to build on and deepen these relationships with those who suffer the consequences of our nation's broken promises. So today I invite you, I invite us, to make our own promise. A promise to ourselves and to each other. Let us promise to commit ourselves to the work of healing the wounds of racism and oppression. Let us promise to commit ourselves to the work of listening deeply to the stories of pain and heartache and powerlessness and affirming the value of those who tell those stories. Let us promise to do the work of building bridges across the chasm of color. That is how we begin to turn the tide that Michael Brown and the countless others like him will not have died in vain. This day and every day, I wish you peace. Amen.